This presentation demonstrates a prototype of the ethical governor, a key component in the ethical projection of unmanned autonomous force. Like, um, I, I was digging around and found these uh, research papers that they were doing in uh, in America, in you know, and they had this program called the Ethical Governor, which I found quite interesting. I mean, I thought the title was great, and uh, it's just the, the fallacies involved. You know, how, you know how, how actually could you have a um, you know a code of ethics? That, um, that governed you know, machines that are, you know, basic purposes to um, kill people and uh, destroy property and infrastructure. You know, I mean, they are all called reapers, avengers, um, predators. You know, they, they don't have these names for nothing. So. Uh, even though they are, they're always um, promoted as uh, being great, sort of life-saving. Uh, labour-saving devices, so you know, keep, keeps keeps our people out of harm's way. You know, so, so yeah, it's like sort of ethical foreign policies, which was a, which was something that they tried to introduce. So, in order to ensure that our counterterrorism operations involving the use of lethal force are legal, ethical, and wise, President Obama has demanded that we hold ourselves to the highest possible standards and processes. This reflects his approach to broader questions regarding the use of force. In his speech in Oslo accepting the Nobel Peace Prize, the president said that all nations, strong and weak alike, must adhere to standards that govern the use of force. And he added, where force is necessary, we have a moral and strategic interest in binding ourselves to certain rules of conflict. And even as we confront a vicious adversary that abides by no rules, I believe the United States of America must remain a standard bearer in the conduct of war. That is what makes us different from those whom we fight. That is a source of our strength. One of the, one of the reasons that they're developing um, the ethical governors for when they become autonomous because they can't really encrypt them and they're having problems with jamming and things like that. And, uh, and they'll, they'll, they'll eventually want to get rid of the operators. You know, they'll be like the checkout operators in the supermarkets, you know, who won't have a, you know, you know. In fact, I think I've read about, uh, um, they did tests with one operator operating two drones, you know. So you think, you know, it's like Walmart, you're always trying to get more value out of the, your, your human assets, so. Um, eventually they'll be able to operate themselves, they'll be autonomous and that's, that's, that's why they, they claim they have to um, you know, develop a, a, a code of ethics. A world-class decision matrix collates the key factors. These are choice of weapons, sustainable losses, both organic and financial, and full legal protection for all elements in the chain of command. With no human interference, the final release position is selected, the target neutralized, and the medical facility remains intact. But the, the great thing about the, um, the ethical governor is we've got this module called the ethical adapter, which means that you know, if any of these rules are kind of bothering you or, or proving a barrier to action, you can just ignore them. It's got a sort of manual override, which is, you know, that, that's the best kind of ethical code anyone could ever have, you know, one that sort of gives you strict guidelines, but you can ignore them at any time you like, you know, so I think, um, I, th I think that that's the best, that's the best kind of ethical code to have, you know, because you don't want to be hampered by, by uh, you know, sort of uh, nice, quaint, quaint conventions, so, as, as, the, as they called the Geneva Convention uh, those, those years ago. This is the scenario which shows the ethical adapter coming into play. You can clearly see this um, terrorist lurking behind this wall in what's clearly labelled as a civilian area. 
as these uh, two um, swords robot uh, ground drones are approaching, completely unaware of what's in store for them. Who is aware is the uh, drone helicopter, which even though it can help them, is at the moment um, disabled by the ethical governors. Uh, it's, it's reached its maximum guilt quotient, so it's, it's, it's actually unable to open fire. So, uh, e even though these uh, two robots are clearly in harm's way. So, this is where the ethical adapter comes into play. As soon as, um, as, soon as a scenario like this emerges, the ethical adapter allows this, um, this helicopter to overcome its uh, feelings of guilt. Um, and reset itself to factory uh, settings and, um, and uh, go into action and uh, open fire on this, um, what is clearly a bad guy, you know? There is, there's an interesting, interesting how, how the use of, of drones is justified because it, it saves lives. So that's often, used as a justify, you know, a, a, a reason for continuing to develop them because of course they, they put our, our pilots and crews safely out of the danger zone. And of course they can be lethal to people on the other side of the fence of course, but um, so that's usually not so much addressed, but, but the idea that they actually save lives is something becoming, you know, it's really kind of a, a, a quite a, you know, a effective justification for them. And, um, but in terms of like a kind of lifesaver and that they, that they, that they might save our lives, you know, our everyday citizens, help to protect America, help to keep us safe, um, uh, all those sort of things, yes. And in the imagination, these kinds of intelligence systems ideally would be, would be out there protecting us. And so, so yes. But, but there's also the kind of, um, in, the, in terms of the sci-fi or the kind of popular imaginary, they're also understood to be a bit dangerous and, and kind of menacing too. And so there are kinds of, there's an interesting combination of, of, of um, attraction and, and fear of, of uh, safety and threat that they bring together. So you see, for example, in films like Terminator, and you see you know, often the kind of idea of the drone or the intelligent robot, I mean, the robotic agent of warfare gone awry, you know, unleashed, and maybe even turning against the people who created it. So I actually went around and interviewed all these various robotic scientists and said, you know, is this something that is a possibility? Let's take this seriously. And there were basically three answers. One was, no, that's silly, it'll not happen. These are systems, for example, that don't have a survival instinct. And in all of science fiction, the story is always that the machine gets scared and lashes out at the humans first. Well, guess what? We're building these machines specifically to die in war, so why would they care? The second answer is, don't worry about it. The software you know, is, uh, will probably crash right at the moment that they're you know, deciding to, to revolt. You know, they'll try and load an MS Word document and boom, just like what's happening to all of us. Um, the third answer though is a fascinating one, is that there is a pretty substantial minority and it has a lot of distinguished people in it who do think it's a possibility someday. Uh, one Pentagon scientist, for example, said to me, you know, I'm probably working on something that's either going to kill or enslave my grandkids. But, you know, it's really cool stuff, so why stop? Well, there's, you know, there's lots of them in the research and planning stages that sometimes you can see the schematics online. You can find the hummingbird drone, for example, um, online. And, and you sort of see a little bit about, you can tap in and learn about what's being planned, what's being tested. There are even drones the size of seeds. There's one drone being tested that is nothing but a, just a wing. It's a rotating wing. And the camera is actually on the wing too. And the camera is so sophisticated that even though it's spinning, it still gives one continuous image from one point of view. So it's, so it's actually kind of interesting how also exploring these new dynamics of flight. For example, the hummingbird drone, drones that hover are easier, to, in fact, many ways to to, to develop than those that, that fly like birds. 
and the mechanics of flight for hovering are a bit easier to harness for some reason. I don't know exactly why. But um, so yeah, from this tiny little micro drones, there's even a term micro drone being used. Um, and uh, so yes, and, and there's also a lot of small drones that are actually even being used in the military now. There's a drone called the WASP. Did they, they come up with these um, strange concepts, uh, this strange language, and it's, uh, it's I find it's quite, uh, I, I, I like the sound, it's quite poetic in a way. It's, um, I mean, it's a sort of tortuous euphemisms all the way through this. You know, the, the more um, the more sort of press releases you read from places like this, you know, the more interesting it gets. Like, uh, like I, I think uh, DARPA uh, is possibly the most exciting arts commissioning body in the world at the moment. You know, they're they're, they're they, they just do blue sky funding of. Um, you know, weird um, robotic pack mules and um, uh, insect-sized surveillance drones and things like this. And perching, perching drones are their latest ones. And they, they'll sort of perch on buildings and wires like uh, like birds and sit there for you know persistent surveillance. So, you know, so I mean, I I always think you know art is where you find it. You know, questions of autonomy, automation. As well, and that is very much also a part of thinking of new generations of drones. Some of them, of course, have automated flight capabilities, like the Global Hawk. You know, once it's programmed, can fly itself. You basically, um, you know, program the whole thing. And but some are endowed also with yes, automated flight capabilities, but also the ability to conduct target searches on their own. Um, automated. Um, analytics for seeing, detecting, um, for, for parsing images, for, for reading sent, information gathered from sensors. And so the question of, yes, when we start thinking about autonomy, um, it's a question of like, where, where is the human, you know, there. And at the same time, you find these these ontological questions, then yes, these kinds of ethical questions also come into play because it's really easy to point the finger and not take responsibility for something that occurred. So you've seen that before when, when, a, um, when someone was killed who wasn't supposed to be killed and you find then the investigation being conducted and, no one, and becoming very difficult to figure out actually who pulled the trigger. So you heard this even in the early days when, just after 9-11, when you actually found out there was actually a, a killing that was reported, and they actually, the, the military basically said, yes, they were flying the plane, but the CIA actually pulled the trigger. They say, they say that, you know, human soldiers are, are subject to, um, you know, irrational rage, and, uh, you know, a drone can't behave in that fashion. But then again, you know, a, a drone, is artificially indifferent, so um, I think it's a a win-win situation for the for the military there. So. The the role of private companies in in not only in drone well of course in drone development, but I mean in drone operations, and so so you find privatization of military operations across the board increasing, and you find these questions about organizations being involved in drone operations that call into play a lot of ethical questions. What's sad about this is you really don't want people thinking along these lines, that it's better for me to keep the war going. You don't want to keep this, you don't want to keep people, you don't want to, same with, I mean, it's a general concept about capitalism, I think. You don't want to put, have capitalistic, for-profit enterprises in, involved in stuff you really don't want to have happen more. You don't want wars to happen more. You don't want prison need to have lots of prisons. Um, you don't want to, uh, these are things you don't want to have, and therefore you don't want to put them in private hands. You don't want to have people making more money if we stay in war longer. 
yeah, I'm interested in the what they call the drone economy, like this complete eradication of the human from the transaction space. And um, you know, drones are just like another manifestation of that. You know, though they've you know they've sort of the, they've accelerated the, you know their appearance on the scene has sort of accelerated dramatically recently. But I mean, it's the same as sort of it's a sort of outsourcing military action and it's I mean it's, it's, it's like any kind of revolution that um, d does away with human labor so I, I think that's that's an aspect of drones that are that are quite interesting um, I mean I, I think of our we have drone supermarkets with, um, you know these ones where you have to do all the work yourself you, you have to scan you have to scan the goods. There's no checkout people. Or there's one checkout people. One. There's one security person. One checkout person and uh, one shelf stacking person. You know, that, 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 that's what I would. I would say that was a sort of uh, a, a drone entity, a, a supermarket like that. I mean, there's very little for people to do now, uh, apart from actually um, buy stuff, <laughs> consume. But uh, the um, military sort of uh, adventure can actually replace that so, so you know in, t in terms of sort of getting rid of um, material production so. so the drone attacks there is something about it um, that it is far more accurate in terms of its targeting than previous technologies but that is precisely what makes it so much more likelier to be used than let's say U.S. is not going to send a B-52 in Pakistan right now, but it can send a drone. Now, on the specific issue that I work on, uh, the drones did not succeed in Afghanistan. There's a lot of uh, stuff out there that says they're succeeding in Pakistan. Yippee, isn't it great? We're hitting Pakistan. It's escalated with uh, President Obama. Uh, but uh, at, the, at the end of the day, you wonder, well, if they're so successful in, in using the higher number of drones, why, why is the war continuing? And I think there's a, there's a reason for that. You'll find um, a good ally for the peace movement are the war makers who are... Um, concerned with counterinsurgency, that is, s small groups of special forces killing the so-called bad guys and winning over the hearts and minds of the people on the ground. Guess what? They don't like drones. They hate drones because the, the drone strategy is the opposite of the counterinsurgency strategy. That, in turn, can erode our credibility with the American people and with foreign partners and it can undermine the public's understanding and support for our efforts. In contrast, President Obama believes that done carefully, deliberately, and responsibly, we can be more transparent and still ensure our nation's security. So let me say it as simply as I can. Yes, in full accordance with the law, and in order to prevent terrorist attacks on the United States and to save American lives, the United States government conducts targeted strikes against specific al-Qaeda terrorists, sometimes using remotely piloted aircraft, often referred to publicly as drones. There is no legal basis for what we're doing there. It's just frankly illegal. Uh, what we need to do is debate in Congress whether we want to go to war with that part of Pakistan. If we do, we need to declare it and do it. We can't just go around assassinating people without any legal basis to do it. Or at least I suppose we can assassinate people, it's just that might is right as opposed to law is right. Until there is uh, investigations into allegations of those who have been hurt or killed by drone attacks, then I think drone strikes um, should be stopped. Um, what we're doing as activists is we are trying to stop a runaway train and prevent anyone else from being hurt or killed. If, if you're a true human rights activist, you're gonna to wanna to spare American military lives, not just our enemies' lives. 
So I think uh, that uh, drones are good for what they're used for right now. I mean, this is the this is the uh, wave of the future in weapon system te technology. Why not keep young men and women safe, um, but but still main maintain the uh, humanity of a human pilot on the ground safely flying one of these unmanned aerial uh, weapon systems? You know, I understand the military position in the sense that when we use drones, no Americans get killed, and thank goodness for that. I'm absolutely in favor of doing everything to preserve American life, and I hate to think of our military being sent into dangerous places and getting themselves killed. But what you've got to think about is, is what we're doing actually making us safer, or is this just the Obama administration's way of pretending to act tough while at the same time actually making our world a, a less safe place. And my experience in Pakistan teaches me clearly that what we're doing up there in Waziristan is making us less safe. It's aggravating everybody and it's not solving any problem. Uh, what the public doesn't understand about drones is the expense of drones. Drones cost U.S. taxpayers millions of dollars um, to, to fly these things, to operate these things, to, to um, create them, to make them, um, to, to staff them. Um, and another thing that people don't quite understand about drones is um, how they are being used abroad. Um, here we're seeing drones um, being used by the U.S. Air Force as well as the CIA um, in um, military attacks, military attacks which um, result in the deaths of innocent civilians, some uh, being women and children, and also uh, uh, citizens don't quite understand that drones will eventually be used for surveillance um, in our uh, airspace. Although these weapons are controversial, public opinion polls show that 80% approve of the use of drones. 80%, I don't think that most people even know what drones are. Uh, they hear about them, um, you know, they, they think, well, there's no one that's going to die on our side. And so maybe that's a good thing. Um, the reality is people die on the other side, so is that now a bad thing, you know? Uh, it's the enemy. Usually it's not the enemy that's killed by these drones. Usually it's a uh, collateral damage of civilians. Um, and it's a very scary thing to have, uh, to be always um, threatened by drones flying over. They may kill your family. You, you may hear about um, a building being destroyed over here, over there, and are you next? Um, if it was in someone else's hands, it would be terrorism. When it's in our hands, it's a good thing. All I can assume is that the American public no longer has a taste for the loss of life. I think the Vietnam War was a turning point in how the American public viewed wars. I think Iraq and Afghanistan were not very well received as wars. They were so-called preemptive wars, not wars of necessity in the opinion of many of our people. And so the military decided rather than risk the loss of pilots, let's use these drones to take out primarily terrorists, remember, Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden. And who's gonna shed a tear over uh, collateral damage if you're going after terrorist organizations? And so it became politically acceptable and acceptable by the American public to use them for that purpose. These things will all be used by everyone else. Uh, if you have what they want is soldiers that walk around that are robots, you know, that uh, somebody can control, sit down in the seat and uh, have a little joystick and control a robot over there and so no one gets killed. Um, the problem with all that is uh, do we want to have these robots roaming around here or do we want to have little, uh, little flying things that are snooping around and seeing what we're doing everywhere? Uh, either it's a foreign entity that does it or our own government can take these and use them against us. This is the future of war. But there is another side of the future of war. That is, the enemy has a vote. And so you have these continual global insurgencies. And that's these two trends coming together, both the unmanning of war, but also the flattening of war. That is, it's becoming a game in which not just states play. And the challenge for all of us is that both robotics and insurgencies and terrorism are things that 
One, we don't understand very well. And two, we really haven't yet figured out how to deal with them. And you have these two trends coming together. And that's a challenge. So if you are a drone hovering above, so you will, if somebody has told you that here is going to be a militant gathering, so suddenly you will see a whole lot of people with beards and guns and many of them shooting into the air. So that seems like a perfect target. So you can go and um, destroy this target. When we say that we stand up for the rule of law and decency and democracy, and yet then the CIA goes out and secret, secretly kills children, then we betray everything that we stand for. And what we do is we then provoke more radicals and we make our world a much less safe, safe place. So we've got to just stop doing this. We've got to have an open debate about what's happening and then when we see the truth about what's happening, we've got to reconsider it very seriously and figure out better ways in which we can preserve our way of life. E even been what about the hundreds of innocent people we are killing with our drone strikes in Pakistan yeah. and in Yemen and Somalia? I speak out on behalf of those innocent victims. They deserve an apology from you, Mr. Brennan. Yeah. Well, how many people are you willing to sacrifice? Why are you lying to the American people and not saying how many innocents have been killed? I Thank you, ma'am, for expressing your views. There will be time for questions and answers after the presentation. In, in uh, uh, Pakistan, who is killed because he wanted to document the drone strikes. I speak out on behalf of Abdul Rahman Al Awaki, 16 year old, born in Denver, killed in Yemen just because his father was someone we don't like. I speak out on behalf of the Constitution, on behalf of the rule of law. I love the rule of law. I love my country. You are making us less safe by killing.